Here are some disclaimers. Please take a moment. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate you taking the time to attend this call. I'm Sir Rajiv, Head of Research at Fundamental Research. And our guests today are Anil Varaj and Jeremy South of Step Gold. Step is a brand new gold producer in Mongolia, and we initiated coverage on the company just over a month ago. So the agenda today is, um, I'll kick off the call with our thoughts on gold and the valuation of producers. And Neil and Jeremy will take over from there and provide us insights on how they are operating a producer during this pandemic. Uh, we can conclude this session with the Q&A. For listeners, you can either wait till the end to ask questions or if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in and we'll try to respond to them. Uh, we encourage questions to be directed directly to STEP since we have them on the call today. And any questions to us can be emailed us separately at info at researchfrc.com and we'll be happy to take them. Okay, so let's get started. Gold has been the best performer among all the mainstream metal metals. The price of gold is up 31% year over year and is currently at 17.30 per ounce. Let's take a look at the supply and demand of gold to see what has been really driving gold prices these days. Let's start with supply, as shown here. Supply has not changed much in the last 10 years, but prices did move across a wide range from $1,000 to $1,900 an ounce over the last decade. This indicates that price movements were not due to any changes in supply. Moving on to demand, about 50% of the demand for gold comes from jewelry, 40% from investment demand and central banks, and the remaining 10% from industry and others. This chart here tells us that the largest component, which is jewelry, stayed relatively flat over the last decade, implying that people were buying gold no matter what prices were. But the green and violet bars here, which reflects investment demand and central banks buying, have been fluctuating. As you can see, gold prices have moved up when these two segments increased and dropped when these segments drop. This tells us that we will likely be able to predict near-term gold prices by forecasting the direction of investment demand. Here's a chart that shows the investment demand. They're currently at record highs. The last time we saw such highs was back in 2011, 2012, when gold reached $1,900 an ounce. Now, there are a number of factors that impact investment demand, but we feel the strongest factor is the U.S. money supply. Take a look at this chart here. Gold has moved very closely with money supply growth. Since the beginning of 2020, the money supply is up 25% and gold prices are up 19%. So we're currently using this relationship to forecast near-term gold prices. This table shows exactly how we do it. We estimate that the total value of all the gold out there today is about $11 trillion. That is 61% of the total US money supply. Assuming this relationship remains unchanged, and our estimate that the money supply could be in the 19.5 to $21 trillion uh, range by the year end, we believe that gold prices could hit, hit the range between 1850 and 1950 by year end. And that's once all the stimulus package announced by the US comes into the market. That said, we do not feel gold prices will keep rising forever, as in the past, gold prices will decline once things normalize and money supply growth drops. Historically, the total value of gold as a percentage of money supply has been about 45%, and that's based on the last 30 years data. Uh, if we use this figure, we are looking at a long-term gold price of $1,400 an ounce. And that is the long-term price we use to value gold producers. With that in mind, uh, let's look at five highly overlooked factors when it comes to investing in gold producers. The number one factor, the, the mistake we feel investors make, especially in today's market, is to invest blindly without considering the location of a company's mines. The number two factor is since we expect long-term gold prices to be weaker than today's levels, we feel low-cost producers, especially the ones that have an oil and sustaining cost of under $1,000 an ounce, will be attractive. 
Number three is debt level. The debt to capital of an average gold producer is 33%. We need to stay, stay away from highly leveraged producers as they might have challenges if and when prices drop. Number four is related mostly to juniors. Um, most juniors are looking to get acquired eventually by a mid-tier major producer. To be a good m and target, we feel a junior should be in the 100,000 ounces uh, plus ounce per year production range. For this, management of juniors should have a clear strategy in place to get their companies to that level. As shown in this chart here, gold reserves held by majors are declining, so they will look for m and target. Moving on to our fifth point, uh, which is valuation. We typically use the five metrics we sh shown here, listed here. For example, the average enterprise value to annual production of gold producers is about $5,600 an ounce. The average EV or the enterprise value to revenue is 3.2 times. And the average EV to EBITDA is 6.4 times. Now you can use these averages to estimate if the company you're targeting is undervalued or not. We have presented steps numbers in this table, so you can see where step is standing at in terms of valuation metrics today. With that, I would like to invite Jeremy and Anil. Uh, as mentioned earlier, Step is a brand new producer out of Mongolia. German, please take it from here. Thanks, Sid. Uh, for those of you who are new to the story, uh, we are Step Gold, traded on the main board of the TSX. Uh, ticker is STGO. Uh, we've just commenced uh, production, um, and we announced in May that we produced over 5,000 ounces. Uh, of gold and uh, have since uh, sold it on. And so so basically we are in production and we are generating cash flow. So that's very important. Uh, we are probably one of the newest gold producers on the block and it's a very exciting time to bring production online. Just want to highlight uh, quickly our, our cap table here today. So we do have a fairly uh, tight share structure. Uh, basic share count is at 50.4 million shares, uh, fully diluted in the money, uh, just over 65 million shares. Uh, and uh, all our options and warrants today have a strike price at two dollars, where we're trading today at about a buck fifty and change. So, uh, we listed two years ago at a price of two dollars. So we still being, uh, we still are below our listing price. Uh, two years ago, when gold was five hundred dollars less, uh, we had not moved a rock. Uh, so the capex and permitting risk were still ahead of us. So roll around two years later, we are in production. Permitting risk is behind us and we are actually producing and generating cash and cash flow. So we're in a much stronger position. And like I said, with a share price, uh, with a gold price of $500 more. So uh, we liked the project at $1,200 when we, when we bought it and started building it and we, we love it even more now. So it's nice to bring a high margin uh, single asset uh, mine on production today and have the ability to grow that into what we call our phase two expansion in short order. We have a very, uh, strong support uh, from Mongolia, uh, both from Mongolian nationals. And most recently, early this year, we announced our landmark investment from the Mongolian National Investment Fund. So it's the Sovereign Fund of Mongolia, newly established fund, newly established fund that we were the first uh, investment made by them uh, and the first mining company to ever receive that investment. So that further shows the support that we have in country. You know, we, we do consider ourselves a Mongolian company listed on the TSX. Our CEO is Mongolian, half our board Mongolian, and most importantly, you know, more than 97% of our staff in country are Mongolian. And that's the way you should run a company in any jurisdiction, not just Mongolia. This is a quick high level of our, our company uh, board of management here. I won't spend too much time on here. It's all available on our website. Uh, quickly, our milestones here. Uh, we started in, at the end of 2016 with an intent to buy and then build an asset from Centera Gold as our leading and cornerstone asset. Uh, we've since raised uh, close to 60 million USD between streaming equity and convertible debentures to both acquire the asset for 20 million US to build the asset and of course operating and, and the expiration and feasibility work we've done alongside that. Mongolia as a jurisdiction is uh, what we think is uh, world-class in terms of opportunity uh, you have a tier one copper asset in Oye Toge. Uh, when that uh, expansion is complete, it'll be one of the top three or four producers in the world. 
so it really is a tier one asset. Uh, Mongolia is resource rich across all commodities. And Step Gold's intention is to focus on precious metals uh, and, and hopefully build uh, a company that has a, a profile of a mid tier. What we offer uh, from, you know, on the Step Gold side is now cash flow. Uh, so it's very nice to have the ability to generate cash and not be at the mercy of the markets or any external financing um, to, to, to grow our company. We're, we offer development through our phase two expansion that's permitted. And, we, and most importantly, we still have all that expiration sizzle and upside on, t on both assets. Our ATO Mungu project that, where the oxides are currently in production and we'll bring the phase two uh, forward uh, along this year, as well as our UK project in Bayanhungar province where we've yet to drill and we'll start drilling uh, this summer. So very exciting uh, exploration potential and, and where we've already had success on the ATO Mungu project. This is just a map of Mongolia where we have, we're highlighting our two projects. Easternmost province of Dornod uh, in Mongolia is south of uh, Russia. So Russia to the north of us and China to the east. This is the, the asset that we've now brought into production uh, where on the same footprint we'll be completing feasibility work uh, resource and reserve updates this, this later this summer, uh, this year, uh, and then move to hopefully what we think is an expansion project where we could probably bring, uh, you know, initial life of mine of 10 years in addition to our current oxide mine of four and a half years online and increase our run rate of 60,000 ounces to circa uh, 150,000 ounces. That, that is our target. And we'll, within a few quarters, we'll be able to, to show the market, uh, how close we're getting to, to that. Uh, and then down southwest is the Udum Hundi project, UK project. Uh, that's in the southwest of the country in a very exciting uh, new gold district uh, where another company and peer of ours called their Dean Resources has had lots of success uh, success in, in the past few years. And uh, they've drilled uh, around our licenses. They're, they're actually working on a feasibility study on, on their license to the south of us. So quite exciting uh, new gold district where like I mentioned before, we've yet to drill. Just highlighting the operation here, this is what we're dealing with. It's very easy to mine and build. As you can see, the yellow circle there is actually AT01, where we've actually started mining, crushing, stacking. And today, uh, we, we're currently um, mined 832,000 832, tons, and, and we've stacked 662,000 tons. Uh, so that's uh, at a two gram uh, grade. So it's, it's, it's been a, a pretty good success in terms of grade reconciliation. Uh, our life of mine grade uh, on this oxide mine is, is 1.25 modeled on our feasibility that we listed on two years ago. Um, clearly we're seeing some higher grade reconciliation and later in the summer or fall when we do put out our resource and reserve update, you'll see some meaningful update to the oxides too, whether it's life of mine grade uh, has increased overall, um, or or we can we can show the market that uh, uh, you know like we're on track to produce sixty thousand ounces this year. We can still produce sixty thousand ounces the following year. So I think that's very important. Currently, we're just using our our baseline production that we we uh, listed on two years ago. This is just the reserve report we listed on, all based on Centera's work. Uh, this is the highlighting the 1.25 grams I mentioned. This is the reserves on the oxides up here. And this is the, uh, the, the measuring indicated on the sulfides below, uh, ATO 1, 2, and 4. This does not include our, our new uh, discovery called Mungu. This is highlighting our operation today. So it's a high-quality operation that we've built in, in, in under 14 months. We built a 200-person camp, hotel, restaurant, uh, doctor's office, all on site. Um, while I'm on that subject, uh, uh, you know, we're living in a COVID environment, and we've been very, um, I'd say, lucky, but also blessed that uh, we have strong leadership in Mongolia. The government took a uh, uh, pretty proactive stance, uh, say, early February in uh, restricting travel, uh, closing non-essential businesses, schools, um, you know, closing the borders with Russia and China. And this really did mitigate any, any cases of COVID in country. Uh, in fact, I think there's only about 35 to 40 cases. There'd be no deaths. And, and Step Gold as a company also took that stance early on in January where we restricted travel 
in and out of the country and through China as well. Uh, today, all our staff are safe on site. Uh, we have medical staff on site. We're, we're, we're testing uh, four times a day, um, and everyone has uh, PPE uh, equipment as well and provided with all that. So we're, we're running a, a very uh, safe operation, and safety is, 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 is number one. This is highlighting the inside of the ADR plant. Uh, and then this most importantly, I think, is, is showing you the, the production cost profile of our phase one, our oxide mine that is currently in production. This, the production profile you see here um, is only based on what we listed on two years ago. Like I mentioned, this will be updated. So you're seeing 60,000 ounces and then a drop to 40,000 ounces in the subsequent years. Uh, we believe that you'll be able to get an update in the summer where we can show that we can mine, uh, we can crush and stack at higher rates uh, that allow us to, to be at the similar run rate that we are this year. Uh, and so that, up, that update, we think, will be uh, well received in the market to show that we can generate more cash up front in these first few years at a higher rate that will fund uh, the growth of our company. Uh, today, we're, we're tr tracking at well over $1,000 an ounce margin at today's pricing. So it is a ro robust starter project that's uh, on track to generate uh, 40 million U.S. of EBITDA this year uh, plus uh, and, and the same the following years. And, and that, that money will be used to, to fund our expansion projects as well as some of the exciting exploration we have. So it's a, it's a unique position to be in to, to not have to rely on, like I mentioned before, on any external financing to fund the growth of the company. Just running through the numbers here again, the forecast of what, what we look like in terms of production and profitability. So this is an important page to show you where we are today and where we're going. So the oxide mine is the top 25 to 40 meters of ATO 1, 2, and 4 here. So these are the three deposits that we listed on as part of our feasibility study. And the, the oxides are based only on, on this up top here. So from surface down to about 40 meters. Everything under, underneath here is, is the phase 2 material, uh, the fresh rock ore as we call it. Uh, and, and this Mungu discovery here, Mungu means silver Mongolian, is part of that. Uh, however, Mungu's never been put into a resource. So we've now drilled enough holes between Sentara's 67,000 meters and our additional 30,000 meters to actually put a re resource on Mungu and update ATO 1, 2, and 4. So as, we, as I mentioned, later in the summer, we're going to put out a resource and reserve update. We have 11,000 meters of pending results that are being assayed as we speak. Once we receive those results, we'll now have all 30,000 meters to incorporate into uh, the new resource and reserve update. Uh, it will be a material update, uh, not just to the oxides where we've had success, uh, as we've seen on the grade reconciliation, and there's probably additional ounces, but most importantly, it'll show that we're tracking a lot closer to our phase two expansion project, which is building the CIL plant and hitting our targets there. Mungu itself, uh, I don't have exact numbers, but uh, it's, it's looking obviously like a few hundred thousand ounces minimum to add to our, to our resource. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a significant maiden resource on Mungu, Mungu that adds uh, obviously ounces to our phase two and will probably show a higher grade um, initially could, that could be open pitable. And so our, our new plan on phase two is going to be, we think, look more like a, an open pit to about 300 meters starting on the far left from ATO2 coming down to about 300 meters, incorporating all three and now four deposits, which includes Mungu. So it's a, it's a new open pit scenario uh, with all four discoveries. Um, and, and then maybe you look at a, a decline underground after a decade into the higher grade shoots. If you go up from the zero here, going up here, this is our drilling from ATO4. So what, the second thing we did before taking a phased approach on this project uh, was also review all the geology and get a better handle of what Sentara uh, collected in terms of data and what the interpretation sh should be. So we quickly reinterpreted the data with our exploration team, our executive chairman, Matt Wood, uh, and, and, and our VP of exploration, Inky. Uh, they were able to quickly realize that Sentara did a great job uh, acquiring the data, but the interpretation may have been off. And so our new interpretation has been that ATL4 here and Mungu are on the same 20 kilometer mineralized trend. And actually, if you go north of Mungu, a kilometer and a half, there's another discovery called Bayangol. Uh, really, really, we've, we've drilled a few holes there. Uh, we have hit mineralization, uh, but this is something we'll follow up on as now we have time and money uh, to focus on, on the scale potential of this, 
uh, of this footprint here. Uh, but what we have shown is that ATL4 is not uh, a constrained pressure pipe. And so going up from the zero, like I mentioned, all this drilling here is ours. So we've now extended ATO4 uh, towards Mungu, and we actually believe ATO4 uh, and Mungu are connected. We just haven't had a chance to, to, to confirm at what depth. Um, and so that's, that's, that's been significant success in terms of uh, our exploration plans, uh, which have been pre pretty, uh, pretty light to date. Um, uh, given our focus on, on putting ATO uh, oxides into production first. Uh, but our first drill hole at Mungu was 46 meters at 50 grams gold in ATO silver. So very exciting, uh, higher grade fresh rock deposit. Mungu has very minimal oxides, has oxides to about 8 meters here. Uh, Mungu means silver in Mongolian, so there's silver at surface, that's how it was discovered. Uh, but Mungu is mainly a fresh rock deposit. And it's a higher grade. So it's, it'll be, I think, uh, a material update when we update the market in terms of additional ounces, the potential, and the grade. Uh, very quickly, uh, if you remember the map at the beginning, I'm highlighting our second project in the southwest. Well, this is our 14,400 hectare license. This is undrilled license where we've done all the groundwork, IP, magnetic soil sampling. And we have four discoveries that we're ready to uh, start a trenching and drilling program. So we'll get to that this summer, uh, probably well before we're ready to, 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 to restart exploration on ATO and Mungu. Uh, while we're incorporating the last 11,000 meters results, and again, up to update uh, the resource reserve update, we can send our team down here and we'll start drilling down here, uh, most probably uh, towards the uh, second half of July. Um, and so this is a very exciting uh, undrilled exploration license that we hold uh, with, with these licenses in the white held by Erdine, I mentioned, and they've had tremendous success in the last couple of years. Uh, they have about a million ounces between their two, two licenses here. And this license here has a mining license and they're uh, actually completing feasibility on, on, on a mine down here. So very, very interesting. Uh, but for us, it makes most sense now to start drilling, drilling here and, and see what we have. Uh, we acquired this license uh, a few years ago, almost the same time as acquiring the, uh, the asset from Sentara. And we, we, we formed a joint venture with the provincial government. So it was the first of its kind 80-20 joint venture step with the provincial government of Hunger. So it's really nice to have them as our partner uh, right, right from the outset. Last but not least, just want to highlight, you know, STEP and, and the people. Like I mentioned earlier, we are a Mongolian company listed on the TSX. We've provided a lot of direct and indirect jobs to the local workforce, both provincial and people who who, are, who come in from, from UB and other areas and other provinces. Uh, so it's, it's very gratifying to see uh, you know, the, how happy they are, they are to work, how, to be, be aligned with us, to be part of uh, something, building something from, from, from nothing, uh, as you saw in the pictures. Um, all of our workforce are Mongolian, our mining contractors are Mongolian. We've set up a scholarship program and a meat and dairy co-op as well. Uh, and as now production comes online, we'll be contributing even more than, than the royalty and taxes uh, to, 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 to the society. Um, so, so just going to highlight again our, our milestones and catalysts uh, over the next few quarters. Uh, we are in production. We are generating cash flow. Um, our first earnings call, our first quarter of production of startup and ramp up is, is this quarter as we speak. So uh, we have May and June uh, uh, production numbers to, 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 to come out and cash flow numbers. And in August, I think, will be our first earnings call ever as a producer. Uh, and I'll... I think a lot of people will get uh, a lot of good data from from that uh, that call and that information, uh, showing you that we've generated free cash flow in our first quarter of production. Uh, that's our target, so that's a very strong start as a producer. Um, and then, of course, next is the resource reserve updates, further exploration on both projects, and then the feasibility study, revised feasibility study, to show uh, that we have additional ounces and we have a path, a clear path to building, bringing our CIL plant online. Um, with that, I'll open it up to, to questions. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Neil. That was very, very useful. So yeah, so let's open the call to a Q&A. &A. Listeners, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to type them in. Um, actually, during while Neil was talking, we, uh, we got a number of questions typed in already. So Neil, uh, let me start with that then. Um, so the first question is, who are the other gold producers in Mongolia? Maybe I can take that. So Rio Tinto operates one of the largest copper gold uh, mines in, in the world, in Mongolia. 
Uh, Step is the only other gold producer that we know of. So Anil, do you want to add to that? Yeah, there's, there's, there's two other, uh, Jeremy might know more, but there's two other private producers of gold, actually both, both built and operated by uh, multi, uh, billionaires, uh, one from Hong Kong and one from Europe. Uh, both have uh, built and put uh, mines into production um, privately. Yeah. Yeah, the, the main one is the main one is the Kerry Group mine by an I reckon similar size to us, but not not producing the same. But uh, and the, the other one's quite small. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so two publicly uh, uh, traded producers and two private producers. Yeah. Okay. So is Centera still involved with the project? Do they still hold shares of Step? No, they don't. They never received any shares. This was a hundred percent acquisition from Step uh, to Centera. It was a twenty million U.S. acquisition. Uh, Ten million was uh, paid, and, and license was transferred uh, to Step uh, before listing. And then we had two bullet payments of five and five to uh, Centera's Mongolia sub uh, in two thousand nineteen and, and two thousand eighteen. Both paid off. So they have actually, in fact, Centera has no interests in Mongolia if they've, they've since sold off their subsidiary yeah, just okay. to be clear though that there is a there is a trailing royalty to the previous owner of uh, one and a quarter percent pay annually one three quarter percent yeah. right but it's not uh, not that that's not Mongolia it's the, it's the owner previously in Mongolia uh, Santerra, right sure. yeah it's a Riva yeah. Yeah, exactly. okay so I have a uh, Two questions that I'm going to combine into one. What is the cash cost? What is the AISC? Um, I can answer that. So STEP is currently providing guidance that the cash cost is going to be $500 an ounce. Jeremy or Anil, do you want to add? Yeah, I mean, the um, we're, we're really only giving an all-in sustaining cash cost. Life of mine, we're guiding to $500 uh, dollars an ounce all-in. We're not, we're not okay. giving a... A separate number for cash cost. Next question is what is the resource size at Mongo? Um, actually, Step is still working on an initial resource at uh, Mongo. Um, Anil, um, you have given some timeline on when you expect Mungu, the resource estimate there? Yeah, so once we get the 11,000 meters of pending results, uh, we should be in a position to put out that resource and reserve update, which includes the maiden resource of Mungu within 60 to 90 days. So it'll take another 60 to 90 days post uh, receiving those results. So it's safer to say 90 to 120, within 90 to 120 at this point. Uh, okay. And we'll, we'll be in a better position uh, in a few weeks to, to update that and, and let people know, shareholders know on those questions. Uh, Mungu, when we bought the project, was an unclassified resource with Sentara. And it, so I already have a, you know, I think a, a couple hundred thousand ounces already. Um, at a equivalent to four grams gold, uh, you know, unclassified. So it's clearly going to be a few hundred thousand ounces, it looks like. So that's a good segue into the next question. When will the drilling results be released to the market? Yeah, again, I think uh, uh, we've, we've, they're, they're being assayed as we speak. We've, once we started selling gold and, and producing is when we got more comfortable to start uh, spending money on our growth, which included uh, paying for these... Uh, uh, final assay results. Uh, so, you know, within, I, I don't have the exact number unless Jeremy has an update, but I, I would say within 60 days still comfortably. Okay. Next uh, is more led to M&A. Um, is management positioning step to be a M&A target? Um, we actually would like to uh, uh, grow uh, ourselves. Uh, first, we have our own organic pipeline to focus on that can take us to a, a pretty significant size. Uh, I mean, we have no idea what we have down in UK. Uh, let's bring, let's focus on our phase two and uh, making that a reality. And, and let's see what we have down in, in UK project. That could be a production center in itself. Uh, given the size of the package, we know this prospect is the prospectivity is, is pretty strong down there and even on, on, on license. So, uh, I mean, we, we don't need to uh, buy anything to get bigger. However, there's obviously opportunities we, we would like to assess and, and move on in country um, if they make sense at the right time and price. Yeah, just to add to that, um, Sid, I mean, we, you know, the, the Mongolia is still a relatively underexplored country. OT is a huge, but 
you know, and all, all their gold goes out in the Connex process. We're the, we're the largest gold producer in month. So it's a very fragmented, higher level content. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, gov- the government of Mongolia and indeed their sovereign wealth fund as investor in the company is, is really pushing us incredibly hard to, um, to grow our, our business in Mongolia um, and, um, you know, hopefully have multiple, uh, mul- multiple operating mines in the country. Um, that's certainly our plan. You know, we, we, you never really set yourself up to be acquired, but, you know, I think we just want to do the right things and generate cash flow at good margins and, and leave the rest to itself. Okay. Uh, at what stage uh, is the feasibility study for ATO stage two? Jeremy, you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, sure. So, you know, I think we're talking about Q, Q4 of this year, right, Neil? Yeah, yeah. We're our target is to get it completed by the end of this year. I, you know, I conservatively I like to say Q1 and beat it next year. So it's, it's fairly advanced, right? Because we have not started from scratch. We started from Centera's initial baseline study, and we've actually had to update it. Uh, I think last year, right, Jeremy? For the yeah, we, we we did a full update of the um, the feasibility study. Um, I mean, feasibility studies in Mongolia are required to be regularly updated to to maintain your 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 licenses um, in order to to acquire all our permits for reagents. Uh, we we uh, we did a full eight month process um, feasibility study for the whole project, um, and uh, so we'll be able to utilize a lot of that work. It wasn't wasn't JORC or forty three one hundred one compliant. Um, it was done specifically for the purpose of getting the permits, but um, you know, so we've got a good starting point. Um, you know, we'll we'll try to get that done as soon as possible. Okay. Yeah. So what we have to do is obviously add Mungu to the mix to this feasibility, right? So we're going to actually do some met, additional met work, and that's probably the really the bottleneck here is is just getting that those samples out and and and, uh, and and getting the results, and that's probably the only thing that would hold us back from not hitting Q4. Next is more capital market side or like dependent based on or your shareholders. Uh, when will institutional sh- uh, companies start investing in Step Gold? Uh, I can maybe take that. So right now, uh, or as of our report last month, uh, Elliott Management on four percent, Triple Fag Mining Finance on five percent, then Management Board owns fifteen percent, Mongolian National owns eighteen percent. Um, maybe, uh, Anil, do you want to talk about Elliott Management and um, Triple Flag's involvement with the company? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, they've been involved pretty much since the beginning. Um, they helped us buy the asset, validate it. So they helped, you know, they sent uh, very strong technical and operational guys down the site when we were buying the asset for due diligence. They've, they've given us $28 million US through the streaming transaction, and they've put in $7 million of equity between Elliott and Triple Flag all at $2, by the way. Uh, so they're very supportive and they put in a lot of money uh, in terms of uh, how much capital has been raised in the company, but that's not a lot of money for them. Uh, Elliott is one of the biggest hedge funds in the world. They don't usually write small checks like this unless there's an opportunity for more. Uh, and same with Chip of Flag, we were their second ever deal. Their first deal was 250 million US. Their ideal ticket size is 100 to 500. So the fact that they wrote maybe what you call smaller checks for themselves, um, was was more of a confirmation that they saw the growth and the opportunity here. Um, no pun intended, but one step at a time is how they wanted to start. So we, 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 we prove out phase one, and then we have probably more capital and backing from not only them, but additional institutions as we grow uh, both through M&A and in our own pipeline. Um, you know, we had obviously limb advisors come in on the IPO as well. That is an institution. Um, and... Uh, uh, Kind of now is the time to focus on new additional institutional uh, investors. Many of them uh, prefer to wait till permitting was complete, which only happened uh, less than six months ago. End of December is when we announced we received the cyanide permit from the Mongolian government. Um, so they, a lot of them wanted that out of the way. And then, and then many like to see the startup ramp up out of the way. So I think you're going to see a lot more interest in the coming months and probably by the time uh, they realize that on the earnings or the release uh, in the summer that, wow, we managed to to generate a, a significant amount of gold and cash in, in just our first startup ramp-up quarter. And that's what they want to see is that uh, you get to a, a steady 
your state and you're able to do this more than, than once, which, we, which we've already done, right? We've already poured gold uh, multiple times. Okay, and then just one more question. When do you have to go back to the market to raise money? Um, maybe you can also talk about phase two, uh, capital raising efforts. Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, that's, that's, that's the beauty of all this is that uh, on a, every couple of weeks, we become a stronger uh, company. Uh, we're producing gold as we released on May 11th. We've shown what we've produced in pretty much our first month, which is a significant amount of cash that comes back into the till. And that will continue on a monthly basis. And it's pretty strong cash generation. So we have the leverage and, and the time to not have to worry about external, uh, the capital markets to go raise equity uh, in, in our current state. Um, you know, you know, definitely not at these prices either. Um, when it comes to, st to phase two, you know, we're waiting for the final numbers of what it would cost to expand to phase two. Uh, we're, we're, we're estimating it should be around roughly 100 million US. Hopefully we beat that even. Um, but assuming 100 million US, uh, you know, this time next year, we should be hopefully moving that forward. Uh, we, we would have generated uh, net cash flow for this year of at least 20 million plus US. So that would be on our balance sheet. Then we'd be in production again for almost another six months. So we have the ability to generate close to 40 to 45 million US in net cash over these first two years. That's net of expiration, feasibility, uh, work, uh, and any, any sustaining capex. So that's more than 30% of the contribution we would need for the $100 million build. And the other 70% would come from debt. So that's our ideal uh, scenario in terms of financing the phase two. 30% uh, of equity contribution comes from our cash and 70% will come from traditional banks at favorable terms as we are now a producer. And in fact, we should probably have no debt on our balance sheet going into that phase two at that point. Phase two financing. Quickly, uh, analyst coverage. Haywood, Haywood covers us. Stonegate out of the U.S. covers us. Um, and we're, we're working with more banks. It's just very hard with banks who can't take site visits or go on a site visit at this point. So it's going to be a few more months, but there's definitely analysts who are who have models ready and we're hoping for more coverage in the coming quarters. Um, the gold recovery on the heap leach is modeled at 70% and silver at 40%. Uh, again, as we, you know, every quarter as we update, we'll have a better sense of where we're at, but it's obviously looking really good so far uh, at a first look of, uh, since our production uh, has come online, uh, that we're recovering well within that range, if not better. The 1.2 million ounces of resources uh, contain gold and silver, but they also contain lead and zinc. Uh, and that's uh, because of the ATO uh, 1 and uh, 2, who, that had some base metal content in it. Uh, and that'll be part of our feasibility study to, to decide whether we would float the concentrations and, and, and build a flotation circuit uh, to be determined. But ATO uh, 4 and Mungu are gold and silver. Okay, and then for coverage, we launched coverage on step um, a month a month or so ago. So if anyone who wants to see a copy of our report, please email us at info at researchfrc.com. Um, any final remarks, Anil? Or? Um, you know, if I haven't had anything or have any enough questions, please feel free to reach out directly to the company. Where we, we always speak to shareholders uh, anytime, and we can arrange calls, or you can email as well. Uh, our contacts on our website, but uh, you know, at stepgold.com. Uh, any questions I didn't answer, please, please send them to me directly. And we'll be happy, or Jeremy uh, can answer as well. We'll be happy to respond. Okay, thank you so much, everyone, for taking time today. A recording, as I mentioned earlier, will, of this presentation will be uploaded on our website and on YouTube shortly. Uh, if you wish to again uh, see a copy of our report, email us. Thanks again, and wish you all the best and stay safe. Great. Thank you, everyone.